Now, if you have your Bibles, would you please open to Acts chapter 2. The scriptures we're going to look at are actually in the note sheets, but I would like to have you look at Acts chapter 2 in your Bibles also, which will become apparent for the reason why. All right, 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us that we are to study the scriptures so that we might learn to rightly divide the word of truth to rightly divide the word of truth. And so as we do that, we have to realize that there is a division. When the Bible talks about the end times or the last days, we have to take, determine from the context, is this talking about the nation of Israel or is it talking about the church? Because they're two different entities altogether. You can't take scriptures for Israel and scriptures for the church and run them all in together and come up with a end time program because it's, it would be full of contradictions. They're two separate entities altogether. Now for Israel, the end time is still future. They haven't gotten there yet. It hasn't started yet for Israel. Now you say, what is the end time for Israel? Well, it's three things. It's the tribulation period it's the second coming of Christ and the millennial kingdom. Those three things are spoken of in Bible prophecy as the end times. Now, on the other hand, for the church, we read that the end times have already begun. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, it says, In these last days God has spoken unto us by his Son. In these last days. That was written in 64 A.D. And he says, we're in the last days. In 1 John 2.18, it says, Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So here we have it again, written to the church. And this was written in 90 A.D. And then in 1 Peter, we have another reference to the fact that we are in the last times or the last days. Uh, we read there, um, I'm not going to read the whole passage, but uh, the last part of it is Christ, uh, Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot who was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. There he mentions the last times again. Well, 1 Peter was written in 65 AD. So the church is in the last days. From the very first day of the church, it has been in the last days. You say, why is that? Because the, the last days for the church ends with the rapture. And the rapture is a signless and timeless event. And the rapture can happen at any time. It always could have happened at any time during church history. And so uh, we're, we were always in the last days as far as the church has, has, begin, has begun. So it begins at Pentecost and it ends with the rapture. That's the last days for the church. Totally different from the last days for, for Israel. Now the church age is sandwiched in between the first and the second coming of Jesus. Jesus came 2,000 years ago. Then the church began in the book of Acts and he's coming back again. So we're living in, in that, in that uh, time zone right there in between the, the two comings of Christ. Now when the scripture says the last days or the end time, we always have to consider, number one, not only do we have to consider what is God saying, but secondly, and just as important, who is God saying it to? Who is he saying it to? Now, from the book of Genesis, all the way through the Old Testament, all the way through the Gospel of Luke, we have the last days referring to the nation Israel and the Jews. Any time from Genesis 
through the Gospel of Luke, if it says the end times or the last days or some such thing, it is referring to it is it is referring to Israel and the Jews. Now, by the same token, from the Gospel of John, right on through the Book of Jude, when it says the last days, it's referring to the church. So. That's a, a rule of thumb to, to keep in mind. You say, what about the book of Revelation? Well, the book of Revelation doesn't, talk, uh, doesn't have that phrase, the last days or the end time, because it is. The whole thing takes, almost the whole thing takes place in the end time. Now, going to the next page, we have uh, pa two passages of Scripture there. The, on the left-hand side, we have a prophecy by the pro prophet Joel. And on the right-hand side we have Joel's prophecy quoted by Peter in Acts chapter 2. You say, why do we have the same thing in there twice? Well, because it's very important. Now, in Joel, it is obviously, this prophecy is written concerning Israel. It, it's, it has to be. There was no church in view at this point. But in Acts, the church is in view. In fact, the church has just begun. And so it has a different application. Now, as we, as we study this, we're going to find that Peter changes a word. He, he changes a word. Does he have a right to do that? Well, you don't have a right to change a word, and I don't have a right to change a word. But Peter was full of the Holy Ghost, and he was speaking, and the Holy Ghost wrote the Bible, and, and the Holy Spirit allowed Peter to change a word. And this is what we're going to focus on this morning. Now, to begin with, in the left-hand column, the prophecy of Joel, we read, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the, the servants and upon the handmaids in those days Will I pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said. Okay, that whole prophecy obviously is written concerning Israel because the church is not even, uh, even hinted at in the Old Testament. So what do we find in that prophecy? There's 10 things, and they're listed right below there. God's going to do 10 things in this prophecy. Number one, he's going to pour out his Holy Spirit. Number two, the sons and daughters are going to prophesy. Number three, there's going to be dreams. Number four, there's going to be visions. Number five, there's going to be wonders in heaven. And there's going to be, uh, number six, blood. Number seven, fire. Number eight, pillars of smoke. Number nine, the sun's going to be darkened. Number ten, the moon's going to turn to blood. All of those ten things are prophesied as to take place during Joel's prophecy, which will be the tribulation period. Now, in the right-hand column, Peter in Acts 2 says... And, and by the way, this is on the day of Pentecost that Peter is saying this. He says, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he quotes what we have just read from Joel. And he quotes it perfectly, except notice in Joel, it says, it shall come to pass afterward. Peter doesn't use the word afterward. He says, and it shall come to pass in the last days. So we have a, a difference here. Is it afterward or is it in the last days? And then he says everything that Joel says, and he's about the pouring out of God's Spirit, which happened at Pentecost, and sons and daughters prophesying, that happened at Pentecost. Uh, visions and dreams, that happened in the early chapter of the book of Acts. I pour out my... Uh, and on my servants and on my handmaid, and I'll pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. All of those things happened in the book of Acts concerning the church. But then, beginning with the line, and I will show wonders in heaven above, that did not happen. So those ten things 
that Joel prophesied, only four of them happened. Only four of them happened, just the first four. And they all happened at Pentecost. But the other six, those other six things, did not happen. They didn't happen at Pentecost, and they still to this day have not happened. Now, what's, uh, what's the problem here? Well, if you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 2, verse 18 says, And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And then verse 19 says, And I will show wonders in heaven above, and, and so forth. Between verse 18 and verse 19, there is a big gap. And that gap has lasted for 2,000 years already. Because what happened up to verse 18 took place. From verse 19 on, none of that has taken place. And Peter says, this is going to come to pass in the last days. Joel said afterwards, but Peter said, in, in the last days. Now, uh, if, if that's confusing for you, which I, I hope it's not, but going to the next page, we have a chart that I think will uh, help you to comprehend what's going on here. The mountain peaks of prophecy. The mountain peaks of Bible prophecy. And you, you'll notice over on the, over on the um, left-hand side, there's the Old Testament prophet. And he's standing, and he looks forward, and he sees mountain peaks. These are things that can be seen in prophecy from the Old Testament. What's the first thing he sees? Well, he sees the birth of Christ. See that first mountain peak there? He sees the birth of Christ. You say, you mean the birth of Christ is recorded in the, in the Old Testament? Yes, it is. Isaiah 7, 14, he's to be born of a virgin. Micah 5, 2, he's to be born in the city of Bethlehem. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, he's to be of the house and lineage of David. Judah 40, uh, Genesis 49, 10, he's to be of the tribe of Judah. Genesis 12, 3, he's to be a descendant of Abraham. All of those things are, are prophesied in the Old Testament concerning the birth of Christ. Okay, the Old Testament prophet can see that. It's all recorded in the Old Testament. Then the next mountain peak he sees is the cross. Jesus' death upon the cross. Crucifixion. Is that recorded in the Old Testament? Absolutely. In fact, the very mode of his death, which was crucifixion, is prophesied in the Old Testament. Psalm 22, 16, they pierced my hands and my feet. That's the cross. That's crucifixion. The Old Testament prophet could see that. Then he looks beyond that, and uh, he sees... Look at the next mountain peak he sees there, the resurrection. Is that prophesied in the Old Testament? Yes, in Psalm 16, verse 10, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither shall, thy holy one suffer, neither shall thou suffer thy holy one to see uh, uh, corruption. So the resurrection is prophesied in the Old Testament. And then look at the next mountain peak he sees, Pentecost. The pouring out of God's Spirit that's recorded here in Acts chapter 2. When the fires of God come down from heaven, then they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now the prophet's vision goes beyond Pentecost, and it stretches across the valley here. And the very next thing he sees, look there, he looks right past the rapture, can't see the rapture at all. And the reason he can't see the rapture is he can't see the church. Okay, that's unknown in the Old Testament. So his vision looks right across, and who does he see? Who's that character standing there? The Antichrist. He, can see, he knows all about the Antichrist from the book of Daniel and other Old Testament prophecies. There's the Antichrist, which comes in the, during the tribulation period. He sees all that. He looks past that, and here he sees the second coming of Christ. How many times... In the Old Testament, does it mention the second coming of Christ? Hold on to your seats. 342 times in the Old Testament. You mean 342 times before Jesus came the first time? It's prophesied he's coming the second time? That's right. 
each, each Old Testament prophecy that speaks of him coming as a king to rule and to reign. That's talking about the second coming of Christ. So the Old Testament prophet, he sees that. Then he looks beyond that. And what does he see? He sees the millennial kingdom there, the uh, kingdom age, the thousand years of uh, peace and prosperity here upon the earth. His vision even goes beyond that to the new heavens and the new earth. So the Old Testament prophet sees all of those things. They're all found in the Old Testament. But in the valley here, he is totally oblivious of what is in that valley. What is in that valley? Well, it's the whole church age. The whole church age. You can't find a hint of the church in the Old Testament. Now, there's types of the church in the Old Testament, but... No hint, uh, no hint at all of, of, of an entity known as the church coming into existence at that time. And because he cannot see the church or the church age, he cannot see the rapture because it's only the church that's going to be raptured. And so the, um, the valley there is, is the church age and the rapture, which is totally unseen from the Old, from the old Testament. So... Um, uh, so the second half of verse 19 here in, uh, in Acts chapter 2, uh, the, the 19th verse there, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapors of smoke. All that has to do with the tribulation period. And the church is totally unseen uh, from the Old Testament. Okay, so going to the, our next page there. In Acts chapter 2, he says, this is what is spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, what does he say is going to happen? Well, he says for Israel, some things are going to happen afterwards. But when Peter quotes it, he says for the church, it is the last days. It is the last days for the church. Now, of the 10 things prophesied, only four of them took place. So there's still six to go. And all six, those last six things, all of them are going to take place during Israel's last days. Not the church. The church will be raptured. They take place during Israel's last days during the tribulation period. Now, we're going to look at, first of all, the first and the last day of the church. We know when the first day was. That's in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. That's the very first verse. This is where the church was born. Now, people say, how do we know that that's the birth of the church? It doesn't actually say that. No, it doesn't. You know, there are some Christians that believe that the church began way back there in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. <laughs> They believe that the church began then, and their theology is so haywire, it doesn't even, it isn't even worth mentioning to correct it. I mean, just they're, they're totally off base. There are other Christians that believe that the church didn't begin till the middle of the book of Acts. There's one group of Christians that don't believe that the church began until the last chapter, the 28th chapter of Acts. In fact, they have a name for them. They call them the Acts 28 people. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the name of their theology, the Acts 28 people. They think the church began then. But when the plain sense of Scripture makes sense, look for no other sense. If it makes sense, look for no other sense. We don't have the word church except for three times in Matthew, which is spoken of in a future tense. We don't have the word church until you get to Acts 2, verse 47. And in that 47th verse, we read there, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. What is the church? Well, obviously the church is what began there in, at the day of Pentecost. You don't have the word church in the book of Acts until right there, Acts 2, 47. That's the first time it's in the book of Acts. Then you have it, church or churches, 22 more times in the book of Acts. Well, 21 more times, total of 22 times in, in, the, uh, in the book of Acts. 
You have the word church three times in Matthew, which is spoken of as a future uh, entity. It's in the Gospel of Mark zero times, the Gospel of Luke zero times, the Gospel of John zero times, and then in the book of Acts, not till you get to chapter 2, verse 47, and then you got it 22 times. When the plain sense of Scripture makes sense, look for no other sense. That's when the church began, okay? That's the first day of the church. Now, the last day of the church is going to end, church age is going to end with the rapture. 2 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, he says, That you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us that the day of Christ is at hand. He mentions a day here, the day of Christ. The day of Christ. Now, that we're going to see that term, the day of Christ, is found in the New Testament seven times. And every time it mentions the day of Christ, something good happens. There's something good connected with it. Now let's look. Um, first of all, 1 Corinthians 1.8. Scripture says, Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's good, isn't it? That's something good. We're going to be confirmed blameless until the day of Christ, okay, that's a good thing. First Corinthians 5.5, 5. to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, why? That the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That's another good thing. Now every time it mentions the day of Christ, that's a reference to the rapture. People say, well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. That's true, but the, 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 the term day of Christ is, and the day of Christ is talking about the rapture. All right. Fourthly, 2 Corinthians 1.14. As also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye are ours, in the day of the Lord Jesus. Rejoicing. It's going to be rejoicing at the rapture. Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he that hath begun a good work in you, that started when you got saved, will perform it when, until the day of Jesus Christ, the rapture. God's going to complete the good work he got in us, begin in us at the rapture. That's a good thing. Uh, Philippians 1.10, um, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Here again, good things connected with it. Philippians 2.16, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice when? In the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Now we'll stop right there. Seven times the day of Christ. Every mention of it, something good happens. Now in the Bible, there is also the expression, the day of the Lord. Now, the day of Christ and the day of the Lord are two totally different things. In fact, just as the day of Christ is filled with good things happening, the day of the Lord is filled with bad things happening. Now, if you, if, we're going to come back to this page, but just hold your, your finger there. If you go to the very last page of your note sheets, the very last page... We put a bunch of verses in there about the day of the Lord. Now, the day of Christ has reference to the church. The day of the Lord has reference to Israel. So don't mix those two up. Study that you might rightly divide the word of truth. Anytime it says the day of the Lord, the reference there is to Israel. Well, what do, we, what do we read about the day of the Lord? A whole bunch of bad things. Uh, <clears throat> Isaiah 2.12, For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, upon every one that is lifted up, he shall be brought low. Okay, that's a bad thing. <laughs> Isaiah 13, verses 6 to 9, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Again, bad things. Joel 1.15, alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a, is, as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. It's going to be a day of destruction. 
And then in uh, Joel chapter 2 and verse 1, Blow the trumpet at Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Why? For the day of the Lord cometh, it is nigh at hand. And in Joel 3, this is talking about Armageddon. He says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And that's the great end time slaughter that takes place when Jesus Christ comes back again and meets the, the armies of the Antichrist. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 3, For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day. It shall be the time, of, time for the heathen, time of the heathen. And finally, in Malachi 4, 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful, it's going to be a dreadful day, the dreadful day of the Lord. Now, in the New Testament, we have also the day of the Lord mentioned twice. Well, the day of the Lord only applies to Israel and the Gentile world, not ever to the church. Why do we find it twice in the New Testament? Well, these are red warning lights flashing, flashing lights, warning the day of the Lord because unsaved people get to read and hear the Bible preach from time to time. And here's these warning lights, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. You know, there's, there's a false teaching today that the rapture is going to be as a thief in the night. That is not true. It is never spoken of as a thief in the night. The second coming is spoken of as a thief in the night. Totally unexpected. The church, which is going to be raptured, is supposed to be living in expectancy of Jesus coming. The world, it'll, for the world, be totally unexpected. He's going to come as a thief in the night, and the, it goes on and says, when they shall say peace and safety, <laughs> then cometh sudden destruction upon them. By the way, that word safety, the Greek word there is security. When people are saying peace and security, all kinds of security, people are looking today to government for security. And when they say peace and security, it says, watch out, for the day of the Lord is coming. Then in Second Peter, he tells us about the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That's the last part of the day of the Lord, and that's where this earth passes away and as Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And the new heavens and the new earth are created. So we have two totally, absolute, totally different days in view here. The day of Christ, that's a good day. The day of the Lord, that's going to be a bad day. Well, let's look at the very last day of the last days for the church. The rapture takes place. Now what happens when the rapture takes place? Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, it says, In a moment at the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised. That's the resurrection. The rapture and the resurrection happen together. The resurrection. Okay. Then notice in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, 52, we had the trumpet sounding. Here's the trumpet again. And with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, the rapture is not found in Matthew. The rapture is not found in Mark. The rapture is not found in Luke. We have one reference to it in the Gospel of John. And then in the, the epistles, we have abundant references to, uh, to the rapture. Now, the very last day of the last days will be when the dead in Christ are raised. And in John 6, six times the Lord Jesus tells us this. 
in John 6, 39, and I'm going to read the whole verse. I'm just going to read the ends of these verses. Fo follow with me. He says, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. That's the day of Christ, the resurrection. John 6, 40, and I will raise him up at the last days. And then John 6, 44, I will raise him up at the last day. Notice it's singular, the last day. John 6, 54, I will raise him up at the last day. John eleven twenty five. 25, I know he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, all six of these here, Jesus is teaching church truth. This is church truth. This has nothing to do with Israel. This is church truth, truth, the rapture and the resurrection. It's the very last day of the last days for the church. Well, after the last day for the church begins the hereafter. Now, those uh, we, we have men that come to our uh, Bible study uh, up at the Big Boy on Wednesday morning. We're studying the book of Revelation. And Revelation 119 is the key verse to Revelation. I met with a fellow this week, and he says, I wish I could understand the book of Revelation. And I says, you want to know how to, how to understand it? And he says, yeah. I says, I can tell you a real simple way of understanding the book of Revelation. And I gave him the key verse and the outline of the book of Revelation. I said, this, this key verse, chapter 1, verse 19. He says, write the things that thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things that shall be hereafter. Now you'd break that verse down and you got the whole book of Revelation explained <laughs> to you. Number one, write the things that thou hast seen. That would be chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. The things that thou hast seen. Number 2, the things which are. Which is chapter 2 and chapter 3, the church age. This is where we're living right now. In the book of Revelation, we're living right at the end of chapter 3. We're in the Laodicean church age. The last of the seven churches. The worst of the seven churches. The Laodicean age. That's where we are right now. And there's, th this can be proven over and over again, you know, if we have the time to do it. Okay, that's where we are. And then it says, and the things which shall be hereafter. That's, the hereafter is from chapter 4, right on through the end of the, the book, chapter 22. So most of the book of Revelation is written in, for, concerning the hereafter. Hereafter what? Hereafter the church age. The church is raptured in chapters 4 and 5, and then starting with chapter 6 is this, the hereafter. Now, Revelation 4, 1, he says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Why would a door be opened in heaven? When you open a door, it's either to let someone in or someone out. In this case, it's to let someone in, and that someone is the church. Okay, a door is opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet. Well, a trumpet should ring a bell because we just saw two passages on the previous page that had to do with the, with the rapture and a trumpet sounded. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In each case, a trumpet sounds. The trumpet shall sound of the dead in Christ shall rise and so forth. Here's the trumpet. And it says, a trumpet talking with me. And what did this trumpet say? Come up hither. What do we read in 1 Thessalon Thessalonians 4? We shall be caught up. We shall be caught up. Well, the trumpet said, come up. 1 Thessalonians says, we'll be caught up. So shall be, he says, come up hither, and then what? And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. The hereafter starts in Revelation chapter 4 with the rapture of the church. And that's the end of church history. The church from that point on is secure up in heaven, but on earth, chapter 6, the scene shifts to earth and the tribulation begins and that's all about Israel and the Gentile nations. So rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, for Israel, the hereafter is something else. With the, the, the church, the hereafter begins when we're raptured. But for Israel, it goes right on into the 
tribulation period in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel says, For as much as thou sawest the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. This, this is Nebuchadnezzar's image that he saw there. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. This is Israel's hereafter. It's the tribulation period. By the way, this is going to be our lesson for next week about that image of gold, silver, and so forth. But that's, that's Israel's hereafter. It's not a good one. It's a bad one. It ends good, but there's a lot of dark days in between. Then we read in what Jesus said in Matthew 26, 64. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, and here it is, hereafter. Hereafter what? Ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Please don't try to make that the rapture. It's not the rapture. He says you're going to see the Son of Man come. The Bible says at his coming, every eye shall see him, Revelation 1-7. Every eye will see him. This is for Israel. This is his, Jesus coming back to set up that kingdom. It's going to be done in Israel's hereafter, not the churches. Luke twenty two sixty nine. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. That'll be in the millennial kingdom. Hereafter. And so in Acts chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 19 and 20, those, those two verses are still future for Israel. That's those six things that have not been fulfilled. They're going to be fulfilled uh, for Israel there at the last time. So uh, this brings us to the end of our study on the end times and for, t for today. And next week we're going to get into that image of Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to see Israel's hereafter, which is known as the times of the <laughs> Gentiles. And uh, uh, let's look to God in a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we are so thankful today for the assurance from our, your word as what our hereafter consists of absent from the body, present with the Lord, caught up to glory, rejoicing in your presence for all eternity. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for paying the price of our eternal redemption. Thank you for what you did for us. Now, Lord, as we are dismissed from this place, may we go rejoicing because we know what awaits us in the future. We know about the hereafter, the end times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>